last time. So last time I kind of screwed up. Hello, Brian. Uh, and it. so this time I'm going to be on Facebook twice, like once from my computer in the Zoom meeting and once from my phone, just in case something screws up. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll have it. <clears throat> we'll have multiple recordings. Mm -hmm. How are you doing, Brian? Um, good, thanks. You're up? That's Hi. already the start? <laughs> yeah, at the crack of noon. <laughs> crack of noon. That's right. Yeah. Well, I was up till five, so. Uh-huh. Yeah, my, you and my daughter, we get along well. Okay. Yeah. Night owl. Seeing her gang like to study all night and go to sleep when the sun comes up. And, yeah, it is pretty yeah. much my life now. Uh-huh. Well, it's the coolest part of the day, so. And it's quiet. I and can the quietest. Yeah. 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 So, and you can make all the noise you want. Actually, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's when I plug in the headphones and, and use use the Roland if I still have practicing to do. So. Uh, uh -huh. So Alberto now has sound, but you have to unmute yourself down there in the left hand corner. Can you do it? Lower left hand corner, there's a little microphone there. Ah. I'm here. Great. And where is here? Uh, I'm in Italy. Yes. What what town? Uh, it's Cuneo. Uh, it is uh, near Torino in the oh. northwest. Northwest, yeah. Okay. I was in Torino once. French. Pardon me? Uh, very close to French. Yes. I, I was in Torino once and we I was in some some little camping place up in the mountains and we I drove from Geneva. Yes. So a uh, lovely town. I liked it. Yes, in fact. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My English is not so good, so uh, I tried to follow you. Yeah. I'm I'm hoping that uh, there's sometimes when you you when you go to on YouTube and you watch a video, it uh, it you can automatically add captions like the words just make the words come across the bottom. So I'm if if I record this and put it up on YouTube, maybe that will help help you follow the English a little bit. Yes, yeah, sure. Because I I'm trying to speak slowly, but I get excited and then. Then I'm almost like an Italian. <laughs> yeah. And are you a piano teacher? No, no I'm a, uh, an amateur. I I studied in when I was when I were young. Yeah. Uh, I <clears throat> then I changed my job. I. I work with computer, but decided uh, to earn money. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe, but uh, I'm very uh, passionate uh, on piano, so I, mm -hmm. I, continue, I well, continue to play year by year. So mm -hmm. I'm very interested in uh, piano, but I don't, I, I don't play in concert or something mm -hmm. else. So. Well, you're in good company here because of the seven people here so far, four of them are amateurs and only three sort of do it for a living. <laughs> okay. Although with coronavirus, who does it for a living anyway? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm very interested in your, um, uh, your approach to approach to keyboard and uh, I I uh, I met a um, Feldenkrais teacher recently uh -huh. and that is because I uh, because of uh, her I I, I, I I know you uh -huh, uh, great well Feldenkrais. great great so I'm very curious uh, 
and very interesting in uh, this method. I so I, I watched some videos, you know, on YouTube, and mm -hmm. I, uh, I I think it's very 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 useful. Yeah, well, it's been uh, quite a. I decided to to do a Feldenkrais training over thirty years ago, and but the goal was I'm going to develop a new approach to piano technique. I didn't know what that would look like. Yeah. I had no idea. I just said, you know, Feldenkrais understands something about movement. Piano technique needs a new insight. So let's do it and see what happens. So it's been a very exciting journey, an exciting journey of discovery and learning and making mistakes and correcting them and trying another way. And yeah. yeah. I can imagine. As as one of the amateurs, I, I have to say that it's really changed the way I think about the piano or even the way I feel the keys. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a lot to do with the exercises that have you sense the piano as well as the ones that help you shape the hand. Hmm. Nice. Thank you. I'm going to uh, so I'm going to go live now with the Pianimals group. And let's see. Oh, it, I guess it takes a while. Ah, so we're live on my own Facebook channel, Alan Fraser, but we're not yet live with the, with the Zoom one, or are we? I can't tell. Oh, live on Facebook. It says we are. So, we're very public today. And here's another Italiano, Cristina Ferrari. Cristina, we have a, a new Al, a, a Italian with us. Alberto is here today. Ah, Cristina. Yeah. Cristina is one of the, uh, is helping translate pianimals into Italian, actually. So hopefully by the end of the years, we will have a Italian version of Pianimals. Yes. Yeah. And we, I think we're also, we've got German version coming up and a French version and a Dutch version and Spanish. So all my translators are racing to see who can finish first. Ha, ha, <laughs> ha, 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 I wish. <laughs> I too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some I, I don't hear very much from them because it's a it's a it's a hard job actually translating, especially because the language I use is applying the language of Feldenkrais to piano. It, you come up with terminology many many times. I'm, I'm presenting at a piano conference and the piano teachers they just say, I don't. I don't understand this language and, and uh, it's it's a, an unavoidable problem because uh, you know Feldenkrais has such a different understanding of movement and you know, we're all we're bodybuilding bodybuilding and Feldenkrais is just sensing and doing small movements and doing less effort and doing slower in order that the brain improve the control of the movement so it's a completely different mindset from, oh, I have to be stronger. I have to play my, I have to play my skills faster and louder. And no, you have to feel, feel the key going down, feel how the, 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 the finger stays loose and yet has respect for its structure. <laughs> Who talks like that? <laughs> so. So I, I, we have a problem a lot of the time because because there's really it's very interesting, but the language is too it, it just doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. I hear that a lot from people. So we're trying to make the language make sense, but it's it's certainly it's an ongoing project. There's always a there's always more to be done. Yeah, I like your look. Oh, thank you, thank you. Somebody noticed. <laughs> I I <laughs> lost <laughs> I lost some foliage. Yeah. 
I lost a lot of foliage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It it was summer. It just got too hot. I I actually I woke up in the middle of the night like feeling that the, a monster is trying to eat me, and I, I was actually trying to pull it off. <laughs> wow! So, it was in your yeah. dream. It was, it was, it was not a dream. It was like a dream, but it was actually, I was actually awake and I just felt like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think yeah. it's time, it's time. We'll grow it again next winter. Yeah. Oh, I, I prefer the way you look now. <laughs> uh huh. I actually prefer the long beard. I actually, I, I think it, it gives my face proportion. Now I, I have a weak chin. No, I don't think so. Look, look at look at my profile. I look like a well, frog. I, I like um, I like my husband to have a beard if he has a mustache because if he has a mu only a mustache, he has a very seems to have a very weak chin. Uh -huh. I think the beard the beard helps him. Yeah. This is true. Yeah, there in Guy de Maupassant, there's this wonderful short story, and the entire short story is a hymn to the wonderfulness of a mustache. Oh wow! <laughs> it's just some. Didn't read that one in school. <laughs> some woman going on and on about a, a a male face without a mustache is like a fish without gills, or something. <laughs> I wonder if he had a mustache. Did he? Do you think? Uh I, I, I think most people did back then. Mm. I don't know. And hats. <laughs> ah, there's Elena. <clears throat> Elena is also in Italy, although she's not Hello. native Italian. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Elon. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. And uh, Hans van Ham from, from the Netherlands. Hello, Hans. Hi, Elon. Hi, Elon. Good evening. Who is that? Yeah, I. Good evening. Hello. Yeah. And we have Kathleen with us with a, a new sculpture or a, a sweater that isn't a sweater yet. What is that? Well, check page 108 in Pianimals. Uh -huh. Ah, oh, well, wait a minute. The lioness there is she's uh, not knitting, is she or what? Oh, but look what's on the floor. Oh, yes, yes, it's the famous ball of wool, which Lucky keeps chasing. <laughs> but which on the on the front picture is all entwined. And That's so right. through all these lessons, we have untwined ourselves and in this ball have huge potential. This is fantastic. <laughs> this is great. You found the common thread. <laughs> of course, Brian. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think your analogy is a little woolly, Brian. <laughs> uh, I'm so working on it. <laughs> work, keep working on it, Brian. Keep working on it. <laughs> so we have another uh, new guest, Philip Engelberg. Where are you from? Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Philip Engelberg, and I am pupil of Hanno Beckers. Aha, uh -huh, great. Um, yeah, and he told me about the meeting uh, today. So, well, I get, I will get here for uh, uh, one hour or two. Yeah. Wonderful. Hello. Hi. Wonderful. Great. So we're all tuning in. Uh, there's a couple. Diane Smith is not here yet. We have one Canadian who is who is going to join us. But it's after the hour, so maybe I'll start because Diane has already studied with me in Ottawa and uh, if she misses the first couple of, of minutes. So uh, we have a lot of seasoned veterans, pianos veterans, and some new guests who are here for the first time. So today we're going to take an introductory look at pianos. And um, what I'd like to do first is just uh, ask, ask and answer the question, why pianimals? Why yet another piano method? What and, I'd like to do first is just uh, ask, okay. ask and answer the question, why... Somebody pianimals? is not why muted. Oh, God, I have to mute everybody. Piano method. 
Because now I'm hearing my voice back. <laughs> da, 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 da. Mute all participants. Oh God, I have to mute everybody. Uh, how does that work? Because now I'm hearing my voice back. Mute. You muted yourself. Okay, now I'm I'm, I'm unmuted and everybody else is muted. Is that good? <laughs> I muted myself. This is par for the course. If we ever okay, now I'm, I'm I'm unmuted and everybody else is muted. Is that good? Somebody else's. <laughs> Why? I muted myself. This is part of okay, the course. I have to I have to turn this one off. I have to turn this one off. Somebody else's. <laughs> I muted myself. This is part of okay, the course. I have to I have to turn this one off. I'm unmuted and everybody else to turn this one off. Somebody else's. A whole lot of it. This is part of the course. I have to turn this one off. I'm sorry, everybody. Now it should stop. I'm sorry, everybody. This is really the Twilight Zone. Stop. Hold on. Unbelievable. This is really the Twilight Zone. Okay, now I'm going to try talking again. It's like a, it's like a complete, it's like a loop or something. We're really in the twilight zone. Okay, now I'm going to try talking again. It's like a, it's like a complete, it's like a loop or something. We're really in the twilight zone. Okay, now I'm going to try talking again. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to stop the live stream. And it's still going. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm Hello. Can everybody hear me? Does everybody not hear anybody else like me over and over? Here? <sighs> Thank God. Okay. Okay. Let's start the live on Facebook again. I'm sorry, this is going to take a few minutes because uh, normally we don't do this, but this is a free introductory session and I, I really do the, want the ma maximum number of people to, to hear this. Um, uh, oh dear. This is unbelievable. This is so complicated. <laughs> I need a manager. I have to scroll down the list of groups to find the Pianimals group. Uh, Pianimals free intro. Okay, here we go. That's going live. And hopefully when this goes live, nothing bad will happen, which would be a miracle. Okay, I'm going to, so for those of you who have been here before, hello, Maylin. Uh, I've, uh, I looked at the presentation I did last, you know, nine weeks ago, and I, I really wasn't happy with it because I presented more, I demonstrated more, rather than leading you really through an awareness through movement lesson. So I want to do it better this time. And the other thing I want to do better is um, to... Uh, set the stage because I kind of launched right in and without really telling the new people what this is all about. So why a new piano method and why a piano method that's based on the Feldenkrais method? Well, um, when we learned to play the piano, I think virtually everybody was taught to shape their hand into holding an apple or holding a ball so that you get that nice curled hand shape because everybody knows you have to curl the fingers 
And uh, so then the child holds their hand in this position and curls their fingers and they try their best to keep. So would you please try this now? Just curl your fingers and, pl and play some notes with a nice curled touch and just notice how that feels and then do something funny make your hand your fingers totally flat and play them without the thumb and does that, does does your arm feel more tense or less tense try curling the fingers again and then try flattening the fingers Somebody's not muted, muted, Diane. Um, I'm going to mute you. Hello. Uh, and so what happens when the fingers are curled is that sets up a certain tension in the forearm. Because it's like asking a baby to walk the way a seven-year-old walks when the baby's only one. The baby, when it first gets up, it kind of walks like this. Dum, 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 and it doesn't walk the way a child walks a few years later. But asking for that curled finger, the curled finger is more complex. And a, a straight finger, a one-boned finger, is much, much more simple. So this holding the ball thing, it's well-intentioned, but it can lead to problems because it can lead to that tension, which then we start moving the arm around to get rid of the tension. But the source of the tension was in this overall a great level of complexity introduced too soon. So this is just one example. I can't go into the whole story, but this is just one. And then, okay, one more story. Then, of course, the child figures out that the, the, the key is very big and its finger is very small. So, so then the most natural thing to do is to use the arm on every note. Because the, the finger is perceived to be so small that it can't move the key on its own. So we often will see our kids with the, the arm going... And it's actually often taught like that. So that you feel the weight of the arm and then the finger catches the arm and that connects you to the key but again it does not make a phrase because when the arm is moving on every note then every note is an individual musical event so try playing a, a few notes where you actually move the arm on every note and then try playing the same five notes with one arm movement. And notice that the change in the sense of stress or the sense of effort or the sense of freedom or, and the, also the musical sound. Uh, some people say that, oh, this is not connected, this is empty, but you are free to move through a phrase uh, when you don't add too much weight to every tone so these are a couple of a couple of examples of where uh, the way we organize ourselves physically has a direct effect on the musical result and has a direct effect on our physical feeling so having done a feldenkrais training i went back and examined some of these standard practices in piano technique and realized that from a feldenkrais point of view we're going to come up with some rather different solutions. And hence, pianos. I wrote four big books, which you can see over there, my, my shelf there. And many people love the books, but they say, it's, uh, who's ever going to read all that, Alan? It's way too much. So I distilled the 250 awareness through movement for pianists lessons in those books into 28 lessons, plus one for the body, in pianos which was published earlier this year. Uh, and Pianimals is, is uh, divided into eight sections. And it takes the hand to be a mini body. So it looks at the hand from the point of view of a Feldenkrais practitioner. A Feldenkrais practitioner uh, improves how we sit, how we stand, how we walk by analyzing the skeletal relations. 
So you could do something here just to get a different, uh, a, a, a very easy idea of, the, would you please push against the piano, but bend your elbows. So this is pushing against the piano in a way where there's lots of muscular effort because the, the skeletal alignments are broken. The bones aren't lined up. And now, come straighten your elbows, straighten your elbows, straighten your elbows, and now push against the piano. And you feel there's far less effort, far less. If you lock the elbows, then the, then the, the and then the whole body, it can sh literally shake the piano with virtually no effort in the arms compared to what was happening before. Sense the difference. Then try bending the elbows again and push, 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 and sense all the forearm, the upper arm, all those muscles tensing. Oh my God, the shoulder blades tensing. Where do you feel tension when you bend the arms and push the piano? And where do you feel the let go when you straighten the arms and let the skeletal structure transmit that kinetic energy through to the piano? So it's a very clear example of a fundamental principle. Movement is more efficient when you let the bones take over the work of the muscles. <clears throat> so if I'm standing and uh, I'll do this in sitting actually, if I'm sitting and I'm slumped like this, my muscles are very working very hard to stop me from falling forward. Where many people sit sway back, they sit straight, sit straight. And you try this now, thrust the lower back forward so that you're sitting very straight and very proud. But do you notice how much tension there is in your back? And then try slumping to the point where you're, you're going to fall and then you feel the back is kind of pulled and it's kind of holding you from... And then try to find a middle place. A middle place. Where you're just perched on... Can you feel those two bones on the, on the chair? Where you're just perched. And again, when the bones are balanced, the bones have taken over the work of the muscles because now... You're in the field of gravity, you're, you, you are, the skeleton is not displaced from your center of gravity. Therefore, the muscles are instantly freed. Another fundamental principle of Feldenkrais, we will use verticality and staying in balance to reduce the work of the muscles and increase the work of the bones. So... At a certain point, I'm thinking of all these Feldenkrais ideas, and I notice, my goodness, the hand is like a little body, because when the fingers move like that, it's like they're walking. So the, the many have heard this before, but I'll say it one more time. There's a ankle, and a knee, and a hip joint, and a pelvis, and a torso, the forearm, that even breathes. And the elbow is like a head. So, of course, the analogy breaks down because, uh, of course, when I'm standing, I'm vertical, so you have to play the piano with a vertical forearm to complete the analogy. But the forearm's horizontal, so how do I get that weightlessness when the body is perched over the center of gravity? Well, the upper arm conspires to pull the forearm back. Try that. Put your hand on your biceps and pull the forearm back. And please do not, uh, and notice the difference with it, when you pull the forearm back and let the wrist stay limp, and when you pull the forearm back and let the hand come further back than the forearm. And you feel the biceps working? The biceps contracts, yeah? And then if you, and if you press a chord into the key while feeling behind the triceps, can you feel very clearly that muscle there behind the humerus in the upper arm, very clearly contracting. And what you'll discover is that different parts of the triceps contract depending on which muscle is playing. So if you ch change the muscle of the finger that's playing the, the note, you will actually feel different parts of the back of the upper arm contracting. That's a stabilizing contraction which does not immobilize important difference. So though the biceps triceps recreate the dynamics of walking, lying down, standing up, running, and leaping. So all the things that the human body does, 
the hand also does at the piano. And when we, we investigate how we come up with a piano mezzo called Pianos. So today uh, we can't possibly, the, the eight week series for which this is an introduction is going to um, um, cover the eight sections of Pianos. We're gonna do uh, lying down the first week, two weeks on the thumb because it's so complicated, then a week in standing the fingers up, now it's interesting, standing up without the thumb is how the keyboards were played for almost 400 years. Uh, because the harpsichord is rarely used the thumb until Johann Sebastian Bach introduced it into scales and things like that. His music was so complex that he needed the thumb, but before that, scales were played long finger over short finger. So two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, three to the outside and three, four, 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 three to the inside. And uh, many harpsichordists now they will play uh, with those old fingerings because it gives a slight unevenness, which is very characteristic of the style. But also, you it, it, you have to use your hand in ingenious ways. It's you're you're very agile and and uh, and not heavy when you're playing like that. So we, we look at that, and then we add the thumb to the standing up, and then in uh, the, the following week we'll start walking and running, and the following week we'll leap and rotate, and then we'll return to the fingertip, and we'll return to the whole body. So the, the eight weeks will cover the eight sections, and each week we'll have an awareness through piano movement lesson. So now we're going to uh, just touch on some of those awareness through piano movement lessons. And I'd like to start with the, the lying down section, which is page 16, uh, for those of you who have the music. And, but actually, we're first we're going to do uh, a later lying down section, uh, which was written for a piece called Amorphous Amoeba. So we're going to jump around a little bit today. This is measure uh, cha uh, chapter 15. So we're going to do some variations. I don't always teach these lessons exactly the, the same way it is in a book. Because your job as a pianimalist is to um, actually work with your students and with yourself like a Feldenkrais practitioner. So we never just give prescriptive instructions. We always take a look at what the student's doing and then we figure out which exercise is going to be best for them. So somebody who's completely kind of wobbly may need a, an exercise to stand themselves up. Somebody who is completely stiff might need the totally opposite lesson, which is why we're going to start with this one. I'm not assuming that all of you are stiff, but we have to touch on all the different modalities so that you become competent in, in all of them and you can perceive in any given situation what's going to work best. Some things, some exercises will help certain musical situations uh, more than others. So now would you please um, uh, take your hand, take your, and let, we'll, let's just do one hand. So we'll have a difference afterwards, uh, the feeling of sense of difference between the hand that worked and the hand did not work. So do you please take one hand and lie it on the key. And if you can, lie also your forearm on the key. And at first, uh, don't let the keys go down. So all the underside of the hand and the forearm is touching, but don't let the keys go down. And then very, and notice how you're sitting are you more on one cis bone than the other? Are your ribs free? And then let the hand descend until the keys are all pressed down. But try to do it without muscular effort. Don't press them down with muscular effort. Just let gravity take your hand. And let's say maybe your fingers aren't very hot heavy and actually gravity alone won't make your fingers press the key all the way to the key bed so you may come in with your other hand and just help a little bit and notice what happens in the rib cage notice what happens in the sense of your sitting did your weight shift 
Did anywhere in the arm let go? Now, don't lift your hand, arm up, don't lift your hand up, but imagine that all those keys could push your arm back up. So you see, now all sorts of muscles are gonna change in the forearm and the upper arm, but since which muscles change, which muscles conspire to create the illusion that the keys are pushing my arm and my hand and my fingers back up until you're just barely brushing, touching the key surfaces. And how did that change your sitting? Are you more erect? Are you more slumped? Is your weight distributed differently? And again, descend, let the forearm descend, let the hand descend, let the fingers descend, trying to do it with a sense of just letting gravity take all of these parts of yourself into the keys and what changes in the body and what changes in your breathing. And then slowly imagine that the keys are pushing you up. The keys are pushing your arm up. The keys are pushing the hand up. The keys are pushing the fingers up. And how does that happen? What changes in the upper arm? What changes in the shoulder? What changes in your neck? And keep doing this. So all the way down, all the way down. And notice which parts of the forearm, which parts of the forearm press the most keys down or press the keys down farther because maybe towards the elbow the keys go down further than towards the wrist because of the shape of the forearm. There's a, actually a little bit of a, a, a low arch in there, is there not? And which, goes, which keys go down more, the wrist keys or the hand palm keys or the finger keys or the thumb key and come back up again, let the keys push you up and let the keys, let the arm breathe down and sink into the keys. And just keep feeling this change every time there's a rising of the arm, what happens in the body. Every time there's a descent in the arm and a resting, what happens in the body? Yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. Now, uh, this is very simple and this is very short, but take your arm away, let your two arms hang by your sides and notice, is there any difference in sensation between your two arms? Uh, and when I started doing Feldenkrais, the teacher was always asking, feel the differences. And I would go, what differences? Like, I didn't feel any difference, what she's talking about. But eventually, if you don't feel differences, eventually you will. It's, a, it's, a, it's an art form and it's a kind of a language, you, 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 the sensorial language you get used to as you do these more and more. These, oh, and people ask the question, what has this got to do with piano playing? Why am I doing this? Well, there's a number of things here. This, this exercise is very different from flopping the hand down, which uh, some, sometimes is taught in terms of arm weight. It's uh, sensorially very rich because uh, the more you let go, the less the muscular contraction interferes with sensation. And then the, the more you let the keys move you up instead of making muscles move you up, the more you can sense little tiny changes throughout the body. And those little tiny changes change the way the brain perceives yourself and changes the way you'll do the movement next time. So you see much of pianos, this is an illustration of the conceit of pianos. Much of pianos will not be doing things like playing scales or playing arpeggios or playing chords. We will be doing these kind of sensorial exercises. So it's not like playing the piano, but having done the sensorial exercises, the hand knows how to play the piano better. That's the general idea. So uh, maybe why don't you try just playing a few notes with the hand that did this exercise? Actually, first do it with the hand that did not do the exercise. And then try the hand that did. And 
notice any difference in sensation between the hand that did not do the exercise and the hand that did. And notice any difference in the sound, any difference in the sense of ease, in the sense, sense of connection, in the sense of actually feeling the keys rather than just playing them. When you play the piano, do you push the keys down? Or do you engage with the keys and dance with the keys and move the key both up and down? Having done this sensorial exercise of gently joining to the keys and feeling the keys moving the entire forearm as well as the hand and finger up and down, the sensation of the entire piano playing mechanism changes. And Malin writes that the feeling is immediately much lighter and, and, and wonderful. So that's all to the good. So this is a lying down exercise. Why lying down exercises? Nobody plays the piano lying down. Yeah. But what baby stood up before the first year? No baby. We all, every one of us, lay down for a long time, sometimes less than a year, but mostly about a year of a pre-standing apprenticeship. As Moshe Feldenkrais said, nobody learns to walk by walking. We learned many movements. We learned to lift the head. We learned to turn. We learned all extension of the whole spine and the wrist. We learned so many dozens and dozens of movements that are needed to stand and to walk. And we did them in the comfort of lying down where there's no stress, there's no need to actually walk. No, we learned them easily and freely and playfully. And what happens when you come to play the piano on the first day, as I said, make a, hold an apple and play. So can you imagine putting a baby on the first day? Come on, stand up, come on, do it. <laughs> That baby's going to freak out and it's going to get very tense. So the whole first section, the lying down section of Pianimals, is to give our hands the pre-standing apprenticeship, which they missed out on when we all started to play the piano. So in, the, in chapter two, uh, we flop the heel instead of flopping the full, whole forearm. Now, uh, chapter two, page 16, we flop just the heel. And we'll make a C, we won't even play with fingers. We certainly won't curl them. That comes later. That's more differentiated. We want to do the simple one first. And we'll just make like a seal flipper. So would you please, the way that you get the heel into the key is very important. You can't flop it and make a big sound. And you, you, you have to let gravity take the heel until the wrist bones, the actual wrist bones, are felt rooted in the edge of the white keys. And then, without the thumb, very gently wiggle the keys. And uh, later on, we'll do two and three and two and three, but now forget that. Just And wiggle the keys, hold them down, and then slide the fingers back without curling them. Watch. And actually, you could slide the fingers back and curl them and feel what that feels like. How much tension is, is developed in the finger? What tension develops in the upper arm? What tension develops in the forearm? What sort of efforts do you feel? And now, slide the fingers back without curling the fingers. And notice what a different experience that is. Do you notice that there's far less tension? You notice that it feels very calm, that there's something, ah, ah, because when I'm on a curled finger, I'm very unstable. But if I slide that straight finger back, it just assumes a, a kind of a triangular shape, like a, a pyramid. And the thumb is the bottom of that, that, that triangle. And all of a sudden, I'm calm. The first time I watched Vladimir Horowitz play the piano live in Montreal, he walked out on stage, he sat down, and he put his hands on the keys in precisely this position, and he stayed there for 15 seconds. 
and then he played one of the most wonderful recitals I've ever heard. But he started from this, this place of calmness. So now, pull the, uh, get the heel of the hand into the white keys. Pull the, the, the fingers back a little bit so that the, that little triangle is kind of manifested, is expressed. And in that position, move the keys. So it's a very, very simple, simple uh, exercise, but it creates certain relationships within the hand. When you do this movement, the hand's hip joint, the metacarpal phalangeal joint, is king. That's the main mover. And that is as it should be, because the hip joint, the real hip joint, is where all the largest muscles are, and the hand's hip joint is where all the most vigorous movements should take place. The periphery is for fine movement, but the core is for the power movements. That's true of the whole body, and it's true for the piano. So we can also make a bird beak. So would you please form your fingers, like curl, bunch all five fingers together like this. See the thumb? And you see a natural bird beak is kind of a shape is and of course, you cannot curl, curl your fingers. They're curved slightly. They're not totally straight. They curve a little bit to bring the five tips together. But it's the pads that are touching, not the tips. The tips would be a, a circle like this. And it's, so feel the difference between a circle, like the Italian, Mamma mia, it's a great pizza. And now flat, feel that and feel how making that circle affects the musculature all the way up your arm all the way through the shoulder, all the way into the body. And then flatten that circle out into a more of a, an oblong kind of triangle, a bird beak. Bird beaks have a little bit of a curve. And notice the feeling of, there's effort to make that bird beak and feel the efforts in your hand that may, and feel the efforts in the arm which conspire to make that bird beak firm. Now, of course, this is too stiff, but you'll notice that it's not immobile. You've made a high tonus structure out of your hand, but you have not actually stiffened it. You've brought it to a high level of elastic loading. Now, feel the difference between that and curling the fingers to make two circles and, and tightening them. And now uh, that's stiff. And now this oblong bird beak is more movable bony structure. And try moving a key. You can do it two ways. You can have your bird beak and move the whole forearm. So try making the elbow the fulcrum. Sense how that feels and notice what kind of a sound you get. Everybody's muted so you can do this on your own. And then you can also move the wrist. And notice the difference between getting the bird beak into a, 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 a key with the elbow and getting the same bird beak in with the wrist. Very different sensation all the way through the arm and all the way into the body. Take a rest from that. Hang your hand by your side. Notice the difference between the hand that made the bird beak and the other one. And come up again and form the bird beak and get the heel of the hand into the key as we did before. So now, this is a bigger differentiation. The heel of the hand is very let go. All the wrist bones are sunk into the keys, and yet there's still a lot of elastic loading in the fingers. So can you keep stay loose in the heel, loose in the heel, and focused in the bird beak, and lying down, Heck. Yeah. So relatively seldom will you have to play with a bird beak. But all the muscles that conspired to make the bird beak have now been galvanized. So now they're ready for action. They've been taught to come alive and they've been taught to move the bones in a precise way. So over the page, you can actually now 
lay the heel down and instead of actually forming a bird beak, keep the bird beak feeling in the fingers, but play more freely. So this is like a baby lying on its back and tapping the feet, the, the ground with its feet. Ba, 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 Do it a little slower first and, and get the fingers nice and compact, maybe not curled, but certainly curved. And, but with the heel on the, in sunk into the white keys. Notice how different that feels from, let's try it now, why don't you just play normally? With the heel not sunk in, and notice how that feels all the way up through the arm into the body, and then again, sink the heel down. And notice what's going on in the sense of let go in the forearm, the sense of let go in the upper arm, the sense of let go in the shoulder, the sense of let go in the body. So you see, it's the way we're doing these exercises which is going to bring more or less benefit. If you constantly go back. Now, you know, people worry about boring their students, but in my experience, students love physical experience. They love actually sensing aspects of themselves which may have not been brought to their attention before. It's a, it's a return to the self uh, to sense actually how you're doing what you're doing. So in my experience, this, uh, they get fascinated by the difference in sensation of being lying down and moving the fingers like that and standing up and, and moving the fingers like that. One more, Chuckling Chicken, which is on page 23, is chapter four. So now we're gonna flop the, the fingers, flop the heel, I mean, and we're gonna pluck with the finger. Now this, how does that feel? Do you feel tension developing in your, in your forearm? Do you feel your body tensing up? Or can you do it in a way where the body moves? and the elbow moves a tiny bit, and the hand actually cocks back so that the movement actually ripples through the whole self. It's like I'm pulling the, the fingertip back instead of up. Up creates tension, but back creates a nice, a fairly compact curl that's completely lacking in tightness. Can you feel that? And you'll notice um, that the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the hip joint, is still good. So this is a first way of using the fingertip. This is a first way of curling without imposing the stresses of curling. You see, we didn't make the hand into an apple or forming into a ball and hold it there. Ah! We just did a quick movement where the, the fingers ended up being fairly compactly curled, but they're still completely let go because they're supported by the wrist lying down in the white keys. So, yeah, Brian, uh, Brian, the feeling is when you pluck back like this, the feeling is that the elbow goes down. The elbow goes down. No, no, let, let it move as you're plucking. So you see, the finger movement goes right into the body. Your body's sitting there like a bump in a log. So let's do something where you, we, we pluck the finger back, and as the finger's coming back in slow motion, the body's going back too. Do you see that? Yeah, I like that. Does that feel different? Yeah. You see? Somehow, that releases any residual tension that might have come up. So I can lie my hand down, I can pluck, and then I'm, I'm just as free, I'm just as loose as, when I, as before I started. So the idea is not to be tighter when you finish than when you started. Yeah. I'm beginning to see why I don't teach these lessons well. Because I spend all the time looking at myself. And if I don't look at myself, if I look at you, then I, I talk more like a Feldman Christ practitioner, like I give instructions. <laughs> so I have to train myself.
to do that. Lovely. Um, then S Sleepy Bear, now lay the heel of the hand in the keys again. And this time, just roll. Actually, yeah, we can try this. Yeah, we can, we can try this on key. You can do this also on a table or on the fallboard if you like. Um, let's do it on key. So actually, when you lay the heel of the hand on the, on the keys like that, th there are eight wrist bones. So now, make the heel, make the hand fairly flat so that the underside of the fingers are touching the black keys. And roll, imagine that you could see those four wrist bones. Let's say that there's one wrist bone behind each finger. But it's the ones closer to the forearm, okay? So now we're going to roll the arm just far enough to get it onto another one of those wrist bones. And we're going to roll the arm. So if we roll the arm towards the thumb, that's called pronation. So pronate the arm until you're, you're lying on the, on the innermost of your four wrist bones. And then supinate the arm a little bit till you feel, oh my gosh, I'm on another wrist bone. And then supinate it maybe another millimeter. And then you're on another wrist bone. And maybe supinate it another millimeter. And keep going. Maybe you can even do uh, two different positions for each wrist bone. That would make eight, position, eight different degrees of supination pronation. So roll slowly across with the hands flat. And feel... The, each part of your wrist coming in contact in turn. And notice when one part of the wrist is in contact, does a different part of your arm let go? And when the outside of the wrist near the fifth finger is in contact, does a different part of your arm let go? How does the arm let go change as you roll more towards the thumb and more towards the fifth finger? Oh. I did this wrong. <laughs> okay, now now draw the fingertips back towards the hand so that there's more of a hand arch and do the same rolling. And now a different part of the wrist. So I was wrong. I said that it's the four wrist bones nearer the forearm, but actually when the hand is flat, it's the four wrist bones nearer the fingers. So flatten the hand again and do the four wrist bones near the fingers. A little bit this way, a little bit that way. Don't move the elbow too much, Alejandra. You see, my elbow, if I roll from, from the innermost wrist bone to the outermost wrist bone, my elbow moves maybe three centimeters, a little more than an inch. And now with the hand in pulled back, the, the, so the hand is cocked back. You cock the hand back and with no effort in the fingers. Do not curl the fingers. Cock the hand back. And again, roll to the fifth finger and roll towards the thumb. But now feeling the other four bones of your wrist. And you'll notice that the elbow doesn't move that much. If the elbow is moving too much, it means you disconnected the wrist bones to the from the shoulder. If the wrist bones are connected to the shoulder, then the elbow will just stay in the middle. That's right. And then for, once you've done this exploring all eight wrist bones, then do the sleepy bear where you actually roll all the way over onto your back. So supinate until you're lying on the back of the hand and then pronate until you're lying on the thumb and the inside of the second finger. So you see, I can, I can show you here. It's actually lying on the, 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 the inside of the thumb and the inside of the second finger. Or, or, I don't know, that side of the hand. And then when you roll over and supinate and lie on the back of the hand, can you actually feel the four hand bones? Now on your back, on your back. Roll a little bit more, a little bit less, and see if you can feel the four metacarpal bones in your hand. 
which one is in contact? Oh, it's the fifth finger metacarpal. And then if you roll further, it's the fourth finger metacarpal. And then it's the third metacarpal. And finally, it's the second metacarpal. So, Annette, this is, this is where we're rolling the other way. Yeah, roll the, yeah, like that. And now the back of the, the, there's four hand bones. Now, if you look at an x-ray, those four hand bones look like a part of the finger. And actually, they are a part of the finger. So can you roll on the four metacarpal bones, but from behind? Because there, there's less padding. No, Alberto, that's your fingers. Can you actually get the, the hand, the hand on the key? Yeah, the hand on the key. And now in the hand, there's four bones. And can you roll the hand so that each one of those four metacarpal bones comes in contact with the key? And then come onto the stomach again. And then keep going, roll further over the thumb until the hand is lying on the inside of the second finger. And there, just stay there and move your body forward and back and left and right. And notice that the, the point of contact of the hand is changing. Like a, li well, a li different part of the second finger skeleton is actually pressing into the key. You can press the second finger a little bit more towards the tip or a little bit more towards the, the root of the second finger. Or you can press a little bit more the thumb or a little bit more the finger. And then roll back onto your, the, the stomach on the palm of your hand and rest. And notice that your resting position now, you feel very different after having rolled around on your back or rolled around on the thumb and the second finger. And if you just play a chord with that hand now or play a scale with that hand, notice again, does the hand behave differently? What did we just do? We just, we gave our brain an experience of the hand skeleton. So I can tell you that there's four bones in your hand. It's four metacarpal bones. But now you felt them. Now the brain felt them. And the brain felt details about them that perhaps it never felt before. On each metacarpal bone, you can roll towards the backboard and away from the backboard so that you can even feel different parts of that metacarpal bone, you know, getting into contact with the key. And the more different parts of that bone get in contact with the key, the more the brain knows where it is. Now, amazingly enough, when the brain knows where it is, the brain is going to change the way all the muscles are moving that bone. So you may have a completely different feeling of playing the piano after doing this exercise, but you don't even know why. You gave the brain the information, and the brain made the new decisions. So that's the conceit behind these sensorial exercises. We don't you don't, we don't say, you're supposed to play the piano like this, or you're supposed to play the piano like that. We gave, give the hand such a rich sensation of itself that it discovers all sorts of cool ways of playing the piano. And it, there's never just one way. There's always a choice when you go the sensorial route. So, do we have any questions? Any comments? Any impressions? Hmm? So, do we have any questions? Any comments? Any impressions? Yeah, Alan, it's Diane. Yes, Diane. It, yeah, it makes it um, relaxed, but not floppy. You know, it's functional, but yeah. like it's not totally relaxed, which what? is... What we kind of think we need, but we don't. Yeah, it makes it um, relaxed, but not floppy. Okay, wait a minute. You know, it's functional, but yeah. like it's not totally relaxed. Okay, I'm, I'm getting an echo again, which I don't, I don't really know why. Okay, wait a minute. You know, it's functional, but it's not totally relaxed. Okay, I'm, I'm getting an echo again, which I don't, I don't really know why. Okay, wait a minute. 
<laughs> this is really weird. Okay, I'm, I'm getting an echo again. And now it's it's looping. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Okay, thank God, I, I figured out how to get rid of that looping thing. <laughs> we'll eventually master technology. It's going to happen. Okay, Diane, that's a wonderful perception. That's 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 really great because so often we're, we're told, relax, relax. I would say that it's one of the main problems in piano technique. We're relaxed and then we're, we're kind of dead. <laughs> and so when, pe when people, when students acquire this skeletal way of moving where, oh, the bones seem to be more doing more of the work because they're well aligned, the bones are really working. Moshe Feldenkrais said that any truly efficient movement will be perceived as effortless. So it's like the bones are taken over and they're just doing it. And the muscles are helping a little bit, it's so, uh, minute that you don't really notice. And then the student tells me, oh, I feel so relaxed. And then I say, yeah, you think that's relaxed, but actually you are active. This is activity. This is well-organized activity. And the classic idea of relaxation is kind of dead by comparison. So that's the amazing thing uh, about these kind of exercises. They actually, they wake up the neuromotor system. They wake up the neuromotor system to better manage the alignments of the skeleton. And the skeleton is wondrously complex. The hand alone has, uh, what? Uh, for 16, 19 plus eight, 27 bones, eight wrist bones three thumb bones and then each finger is four bones it's and all of that the 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 wrist is not flat the hand has four arches the hand has the the russian arch which goes from fingertip to the peak of the metacarpal phalangeal joint and then down to the wrist it's got the transverse arch which goes from the fifth metacarpal to the second metacarpal to the thumb metacarpal phalangeal joint uh no these metacarpal phalangeal joints and the thumb, yeah, metacarpal phalangeal joint, yeah. And it has the, what I call the Roman arch, this second finger, then second metacarpal and thumb. That's also an arch. And the fourth arch is the wrist. If you take your hand, one hand with the other, and kind of try to, I can do it like this. It, this actually, you know, we say that this hand is a pelvis. Well, look at this, the thenar group and the hypothenar group. Well, that's the hands, two butt cheeks, obviously. Look at that. And you can bring them closer together. You can actually almost, you can, you feel like the, the fifth metacarpal, which is here, and the thumb metacarpal from here, you can bring them very close. Now, when you bring them close like that, the fourth arch of the hand is the wrist the carpal arch, the wrist is not flat. And those wrist bones will curve more, that arch will curve more, or it will flatten out more. So you see, in that uh, trajectory as well, it's a living, breathing kind of a bellows that's inflating and, and deflating, and always vital, always sensitive, always responsive. So yes, it, it feels alive uh, and movable and yet relaxed is perhaps not the first word we would use to describe it. Very cool. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. I see I, uh, Maria looking for her microphone, but I don't know if she wants to say anything or not. Can you hear me? Anna. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say... Uh, I don't uh, hear you, Anna. No? Don't know why. We do. We hear it. I hear her. Yeah. You, you do? No, I you I'm do. not hearing anything. Oh. Uh, uh, Technology again. 
while we're waiting for Anna to figure out her microphone, how about no, Amy? No, 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 no. Amy's no. not Amy. I don't hear Amy either. What's going on? I, can hear. I don't can. know. Ah, you how muted. Can we have a Zoom uh, meeting. Okay, let's. You if, muted. If uh, we're not all. Okay, Anna, mute, unmute. Hello. Amy. Oh, Amy. Yeah, Amy, yeah. mute, unmute. I have no idea what's going. Oh, I do. I do know what's going on. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I do know what's going on. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Hold on. Hold if on. I hear you, I also hear my own echo. And if I cut off my own echo, I also cut off your voices. So, so we're just going to have to okay. deal with it. I'm going to I'm going to listen to you and hear my echo. I also hear my own echo. And if I cut off my own echo, and, uh, I You muted yourself. Okay, Anna, can you can I can you hear can you can yes, I hear you? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. It's funny uh, because we never had this problem before. <laughs> no, it's because I was broadcasting on Facebook Live, and it's it created all sorts of problems, which were uh, not uh, pre uh, not expected. Anyway, Anna, what do you want to say? I just wanted to say that after the last eight weeks during uh, the exercises, my hand, it began, when I began, my left hand was very, very weak and disconnected one part of the other. And the, the fourth and fifth always like inside, not, not well. And today, when we repeat the exercise, it's all connected and with my body also, it's amazing. So. Thanks a lot because uh, and 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 my head I can feel my head also liberating uh, tension so like in the neck area here actually in the head yes back like when we were rolling like this and very slowly and each bone so all this from from I imagine from the yeah from the neck but I felt all this like opening and uh, amazing. Fantastic. So thank you. Well, yeah, that's that's great. But th that, to, that to me is the wonder of Feldenkrais. And when we didn't, you know, she has a weak fourth and fifth finger and there's a, some sort of funny thing with the thumb. And we did not try to address any of that at all. No, we just said, okay, let's feel the fifth metacarpal more. Let's feel the fourth metacarpal more. Let's feel how those metacarpals are folding in on each other and unfolding and rolling over. And let's feel how the, the phalanges bones and the metacarpal bones interrelate. And we just roll them and flop them so they get curled and uncurled with no effort to curl and uncurl the curling and uncurling is happening from an external influence and the brain is just picking up all sorts of sensory information the the, the picture of the bone each bone in the brain in the motor cortex is getting enriched and clarified and all of a sudden 
her hand is moving better. So for me, that it's a classic example. This, it's the miracle of Feldenkrais. It really is. <laughs> it's just uh, over and over again. I, I never get tired of, of the, the wondrous results of this method that Moshe Feldenkrais developed last century. Great. Um, Alan? Yes, Maria. Hello. Uh, my impression is uh, that uh, this way uh, seems uh, to affect uh, the keys. Uh, I mean, uh, the keys um, uh, seems to be more intelligent and they uh, respond uh, to my intention. Uh, did you say the, did you say the tip the tip not the the keys the keys the key are more responsive the keys got more responsive yes <laughs> that's fantastic we gave feldenkrais to our piano <laughs> <laughs> yes but isn't that in, isn't that fascinating that we we became more responsive and then the instrument also becomes more responsive and that's an absolutely just perception that's absolutely true perception because when we when we are more sensitive to the key we will not abuse that key we will feel that key so we will feel how that key always wanted to be responsive to us and now we feel it now we can respect it. Now we can dance with it. Now we can play with it. So that responsiveness is always there. But our subjective experience is that the key became more responsive because we are more responsive to it. So that's wonderful. You know, uh, you know, there's this old old visual, visual optical illusion where you, you, uh, you wiggle the pencil and it looks like it's rubber. I remember my brother showing, hey, Alan, look at this rubber pencil. And and if you, you get to the point where you're making the keys feel rubbery because you're, you're so in that kind of elastic, fluid, res responsive relationship to the key. It can actually, it can even go that far. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Shall we do a little bit more? Uh, I, I did, I, I spend two whole weeks on the thumb. So, uh, perhaps it's a, it's, it's good to review a little bit. Some of you have heard this before, but it never hurts to, uh, to go over this material because the thumb, of course, uh, if, if you adduct the thumb to the hand, that's how monkeys pick things up. Monkeys, for the most part, don't know, cannot oppose the thumb to the hand. So would you please feel the difference between uh, bringing the thumb straight across to the hand and then moving it away from the hand and down and around in a big circle until it touches the fingers. Now, do that several times. So oppose the thumb by doing it in a big circle and you'll notice that it that the hand naturally rotates so look feel this oppose the thumb to the fingers and pronate the hand and now oppose the fingers to the thumb and supinate the hand so the action of bringing the fingers and thumb together can lead you to pronate or to supinate depending on which initiates so feel if you initiate with the fingers the natural movement what's the natural movement if you initiate with the thumb what's the natural movement and now would you please slightly just curl the fingertips and curl the thumb tip just a little bit and feel what changed in the sense of and now would you try to oppose the thumb to the finger and feel how that feels in your hand try different fingers curl them curl them curl them curl them and sense 
the degree of effort, the degree of tension, the degree of let go anywhere in the forearm, the upper arm, the shoulder, the neck, the body. And then again, flat, thumb to second, thumb to third, thumb to fourth. And what is the degree of let go in the forearm, in the wrist, in the elbow, in the upper arm? So go back and forth. Try curl, 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 touch, flat, 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 touch, and sense the difference. So there's a huge difference. Basically, if the fingertips are curled, you cannot oppose. And when the fingers are flat, you can oppose. Now, the, the, the uh, babies, the first grasping that a baby does is a tight curl, but that curl is so tight that you see the, the finger, the, the metacarpal phalangeal joint is still on top. The top knuckle is still prominent. One more exercise before we go to the thumb. Would you please, actually, it is related to the thumb. Would you please curl, lay the hand down, curl the finger, and move the hand forward so that that metacarpal phalangeal joint stays low. Yeah, Alberto, not like that. Uh, you're doing it the good way, but do it the bad way. Uh, no, the, the bad way is that where you, somehow you curl the fingers and the metacarpal joint, phalangeal joint stays low. Yeah, that. And feel how bad that is. <laughs> you feel... It, everything is scrunched up. There's already tension in the forearm. Feel how much tension develops in the forearm when you curl the fingertips, but leave the metacarpal phalangeal joint out of the game. And then feel how much better when you bring the metacarpal phalangeal joint into the game. And that's the first babies. I was looking for babies opposing the thumb and I couldn't find any because they all do this. They all tighten the curl. And I realized, okay, that's a developmental step where the metacarpal phalangeal joint is in the game. But I wanted you to experience this one where the metacarpal phalangeal joint is out of the game because many pianists play like this. Many pianists go down this road where we were taught to curl and we were not, the hand's hip joint was not taught to be in the game. So you may, you may not suffer from this yourself, but you may recognize it in some of your students. So now, uh, draw the thumb. Okay, if you if your hand was in the air and you drew the thumb to the fifth finger, it would be like that, straight, no curling. Yeah. So try doing that on key or on a table, and what happens? What happens? The arch of the hand appears. So the arch of the hand can be generated. Try this. Just flat curl flat uh, flat flex whole finger flexion of, of the four fingers no thumb and feel the hand arch being developed and then do do the thumb coming under the thumb coming under and thumb opposition is an equally effective way of creating a hand arch so the hand arch is so great because that structure of the arch has a keystone and the keystone the more weight you put on it the more strong it becomes so this wonderful arch structure is going to be the power source and when we don't have that arch structure we're in trouble and the thumb you see when when the the knuckle is down bring your knuckle down and notice that the thumb has already curled and now bring the knuckles up and notice that as you're bringing the knuckles up, the thumb is straightening. And now the thumb is gloriously straight. And now bring the knuckles down and you cannot bring the knuckles down and leave the thumb straight. It's going to curl. And you cannot really put the knuckles up without the thumb straightening. That's the different parts of the hand are actually interrelated. Feel that. So on purpose, collapse the arch and notice what happens to your thumb. And build the arch and notice what happens to your thumb. And sense what's happening in the hand itself, sense what's happening in the forearm, sense what's happening in the elbow, behind the elbow. Uh, Hans, could you show me the bad one, please? I just, I'm interested. 
yeah, that <laughs> feels awful, right? It's like unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. And now Maria show me the good one, the bad one, the good one. That's the bad one. And uh, now do the good. Yeah, that's the good one. Right. So. So if we continue this movement of drawing the thumb under, then eventually the thumb can stand and the fingers can leave the table. That's right. And, and come back down. Slowly, 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 slowly. Now watch, my, my second metacarpal is still close to my thumb and now I create a space. It's called a thumb push-up. And now I slowly, slowly reduce the space. So please, and come back till the hand is lying on the table. Still with a, a, a little bit of an arch. So try to move the thumb under. Feel that arch developing until the fingers leave the table. And then keep using the thumb to push the hand up into the air. Not your elbow, Alejandra. No. Okay, I am doing my elbow. Damn. My fingers are always ahead of my elbow. Yeah, the fingers, yeah, the fingers have to stay ahead of the elbow. So, so slowly, slowly, slowly open the space between the thumb and the second. And then slowly, slowly, slowly close the space between the thumb and the second. And bring the hand back down to lie and take a rest. And really take a rest and notice what feels different all through your arm and your, the, that side of your body. Just from having done one thumb push up. So this looks like bodybuilding, but again, the value or the, the, the treasure of this lesson is in the sensorial change. So again, you begin to oppose the thumb to the fingers. The hand starts to grow into an arch and then the fingers leave the table. And now your thumb could work to push the fingers up in the air. So the thumb and now the thumb is almost like a trampoline. So now don't go back down to the table. Stay with the fingers in the air and then just get that space between the hand and the thumb a little less and a little more and a little less and a little more and even make it springy, springy. And I, want, I, I would love to see it with the fingers staying pointed to the ceiling the whole time. Yeah, Ramon, you're waving your fingers around. But you see, if you wave your fingers around like that, there's nothing going on in the thumb. Now, I'm not going to wave my fingers. I'm going to open and close the, the space between the hand and the thumb. So the thumb has to work. No, oh, uh, uh, Okay, the thumb is 90 degrees. The thumb is ver vertical. It's, it's standing straight up. And now bring the thumb to 45 degrees and bring the thumb to 30 degrees and bring the thumb almost to lying down on the table. And now as the thumb goes back to standing vertically, open the fingers up, open the fingers up. And now Ramon, bring the thumb back to almost lying down, almost lying down, almost like close the hand, close the hand. They go together. Look, the hand is almost closed. The thumb is almost lying down. The hand is open. The thumb is vertical. As the thumb goes to lying down, the hand goes to almost closed. They're together. That's better. Take a rest. Please, everybody, if you, get, if you get tired, take a rest. And now, Anna, that's better. Anna, if you could do it and keep the hand kind of sideways. And now come back here. No, come back here. Towards yourself, Anna, not away from yourself. That's better. And now up, up, and now back down. <laughs> Not over there. <laughs> You'll see, if you watch everybody, everybody's got their own version of doing this. We've got 25 people, we've, and you know, not everybody's got their camera on, but we've got many, many different versions of this. 
If you're just watching this and not doing it yourself, you're probably thinking we're all nuts. <laughs> but as, as we said, the thumb is going to develop all sorts of musculature. But again, it's not for bodybuilding. It's to develop the sensitivity as to how that musculature is working the thumb skeletal structure. Did you notice in all this that the thumb has not three phalanges? The finger has the distal, medial, proximal phalange. The thumb has the distal, proximal phalange. Then this third part, which is like the thigh bone of the thumb, is called the metacarpal bone. So you see the metacarpal bone of the thumb is its thigh bone, but it's way closer to the wrist. Now the thigh bone of the finger is over here. It's next to the hand. So you see the four finger thigh bones are nowhere near the thumb thigh bone. And that's why the thumb comes across and comes under. The thumb is like the, the left thumb is like the right leg of the left hand. And the second finger is like the left leg of the left hand. And then you've got three extra left legs. You understand? That's why we're doing this thumb push up and this thumb standing and this thumb uh, cantilevering. So feel that sense of the thumb where the wrist is not too high and the thumb is very springy and the hand is a little higher or a little lower or a little higher or a little lower, but never collapsed and never rigid tense, always springy. That's it. Amy, get your wrist down. Pull your wrist back here, Amy. Amy, bring your wrist back here. The, the thumb, wrist, thumb, wrist, thumb, wrist. There. If you could do that without curling your fingers, it would be amazing. Ah, did you feel something click? The, all the parts of the skeleton started working together. Hans, it's been lovely to have you with us. Any questions about the thumb? The, uh, the Oranga thumb. So actually, we didn't even do any of the exercises that are in the thumb section. Chapter 6, Chapter 7, Chapter 8. Uh, because we started off in Pianimals by doing this kind of, this is the first part of chapter six, but then we do a whole other part where we rotate and we come down here. And again, who's ever going to play the piano like that? Who's ever going to play the piano like that? But boy, when your thumb learns to do this, this is like the pre-standing apprenticeship. This is what we do before we play the piano so that when we come to play the piano, we will not fall down on the thumb when we play our scales in our arpeggios. Then we make a bird beak and we actually, we use that bird beak to slide. And of course, when, as soon as we've made a bird, we, we did the bird beak earlier, but now we see the, the purpose of the bird beak is to relate the thumb to the fingers. That bird beak, ah, the thumb is automatically opposed and flat. So that sensation is gonna be useful very in many many situations now the very quickly if you take that the thumb and clamp the hand to the thumb and then put the thumb in a key and then make a tiny space and then clamp again and a tiny space and then clamp again you feel it's a two-dimensional kind of a jaw which is more like a crocodile jaw that's chapter nine then over the page we get the alligator jaw where you start there but then you pull the hand back and create a triangle structure a bird beak where you're only using your second finger your thumb and then you'll open it and close it try these open that and close that alligator jaw so gently there's a lot of strength in there, but there's also delicacy so that you, if there was a little birdie inside, you would not eat it. So yawn and then close the jaw so that the little birdie is safe. 
And then, of course, if the if the alligator gets hungry, then, of course, then you do it more quickly and you snap that bird up. Amy, your fingers are curled. If you could do that with your fingers totally straight, how different would that feel? No, the second finger, straighten the second finger, and I'll bring it down, keeping it straight, keep it straight, keep it straight, keep it straight, keep it straight. Keep it straight. How different does that feel? In your forearm, in your elbow, in your upper arm, in the, uh, uh, uh. You see, even when you curl it that much, you're gonna, you're gonna feel the difference everywhere, all through the shoulder and the body and everywhere. So that's it, you feel the difference? That difference is very important. We will need to curl, but we need to do the whole finger movements first. Cause I think that's- I have trouble with sensitivity, you know? Pardon me? I think I have trouble with sensitivity cause I'm, I'm not- You don't feel the difference? I felt the I felt it easier to curl it <laughs> because right. I was relaxing my hand. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. There. So uh, this is not relaxed. This is not relaxed. This is bringing the hand to a high state of elasticity. This is increasing the tonus. Here, All the, yeah. the the when you don't curl, the first dorsal interosseous works much more. Okay. The first dorsal interosseous is like one of the most important muscles in the hands. It's kind of I like the psoas. I feel that not not relaxing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Don't don't relax that muscle. You want to work that muscle. So we said it's not bodybuilding, but sometimes waking a muscle up and actually making it work. It's that's the functional strategy. We need we. It's not just about relaxation and let go. Okay. It's about changing the organization so that. So the, the muscles can move that skeleton in the most effective way. This is relaxed, curled is relaxed, but it doesn't feel like it could go anywhere, right? It's exactly. A break. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So we've, we've looked at lying down. We've looked at the thumb. And those are two of the eight sections of pianimals. And... I like to review those two for the people who've already been through the course because, uh, well, we, we took a little bit of a different slant, a different little bit of a different look at them today. And I think these, these experiences are so valuable that it's, it's always good to refresh and to take the ideas a little bit further. And then to go to the piano and see spontaneously what happens differently in your playing and what sensations and what sense of ability do you have that's a little bit different from before. Uh, any other questions, impressions, comments, observations? Well, I was wondering if you, you know, if you want to look at somebody playing, you know, with that particular thing in mind. I mean, we learn a lot when when you have a lesson afterwards. Okay, could could you just uh, do that? Do it. Do a little pattern, whatever you like, with once with the uh, trying as far, hard as you can to keep that bird beak structure, and so the the straight finger. Do it like that. Yeah, and that's really new for me. Yeah, right. Okay, try the old way. So it feel yeah I, I kind of feel that I because I remember how relaxed it felt and 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 yet un and yet not working you know um, so when I play like uh, I always feel like I'm working so hard <laughs> elsewhere you know I get really tired but, but maybe this I don't know okay Did it, does anybody else want to comment before I comment. What did anybody else see? One of the things we're doing, we want to work with our students on this stuff. So we have to start, we have to start being, uh, you know, uh, really eagle eyed in our perception. Because to me, it was obvious, but I've been doing this for years. And it was, Amy, Amy, your language and everything was perfect. Because you said that this one was very unfamiliar to you. 
and we see that it's actually very good. It's like that there's strength and the strength is right where it needs to be in the hand itself. And then I said, okay, now do the old one. And you went like, and the hand was not, not the, the trouble is that when you curled your fingers, which we're all taught to curl our fingers, that was not the only result. You curled your fingers and the hand collapsed and there was immediate difficulty, but there's weakness in the hand. So the the difficulty comes from efforts everywhere else which is exactly what you said compensating for the structural weakness in the hand you see it doesn't even sound well it sounds kind of like i'm tripping or something and there's tension in my forearm there's tension in my upper arm there's tension in my shoulder all of that is trying to hold the hand up because the hand is not holding itself up and now i'm gonna yeah, and, and I feel dis I did I feel disconnected from the piano too. I feel like when I curl my fingers, I'm I'm now over here. I'm over here. I'm not in the piano. <laughs> yeah. So this simple movement, this simple movement connects you to your instrument. It's all, almost as, as if you did you did the movement and you pulled yourself into your instrument, like, well, oh, I got inside it. <laughs> It just takes a lot of practice, huh? Well, it's very new, but that's why we have pianos. That's why we have all these sections so that we can we can give the hand a whole series of experiences that integrate that new feeling so that when you go to your instrument, you will feel that, oh, I engaged with my instrument. I'm not sitting there like a bump on a log, kind of like overly neutral and actually divorced. No, uh, this drawing into the hand it instantly connects me. I can almost feel, and this is, happens at the end of the book, chapter 29, you, you do this drawing in of, the, of a whole finger and you allow the pelvis to be drawn forward. But I did not rock my pelvis forward. I did not use any pelvis muscles. I did a, a whole finger flexion of my finger and that alone pulls my pelvis forward. Now that's a really weird feeling, but if you curl, you can still do it, but the feeling is so much power, more powerful if you, if you straighten. So everybody try. Just curl the finger, curl, sit there, and try to feel that if you push and pull on that, you can actually pull your pelvis forward and push your pelvis away. Push your pelvis, pull your pelvis forward and push your pelvis away. And now just curl your finger and feel how much it pulls your pelvis forward. And now do this classic whole finger flexion drawing the hand drawing the hand up into its arch structure and feel what it does to your pelvis so if you curl virtually nothing happens to the pelvis and if you do a whole finger flexion that pelvis is just pulled forward can you feel that and it's very important to get the 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 point of initiation clear your pelvis is just neutral if you were just sitting there like a bump in a log, nothing would happen. And then if you curl, still nothing happens. And if you do a whole finger flexion while holding onto the key, if you're not tense or something or not blocked, it's inevitable that that finger flexion attached to the piano pulls you, your whole torso forward, rocking on the pelvis. That's right. So you see, we really do play the piano with our whole body, with our whole self. This is just one classic and graphic example of what it means to play the piano with your whole self and how that hand arch is a crucial tool in bringing and joining the self to the piano. And when we just curl and that hand arch stays empty, then our relationship to the piano stays empty too. Now, I, I'm not dismissing curling. I'm not throwing curling out the window. Curling is extremely important. It's, and if you look on the wall back there, you'll see Wanda Landowska, who was the first owner of this piano, by the way, pulling her fingers back and curling them, highly curling them, dropping her arts to curl her fingers more. So what's that about? That's something that's not even in here. 
because it's so advanced. Curling the fingers works when you elastically load them as you curl them, which is why we did that. It is in here because we did, remember we did that plucking. If you do that plucking with a little more vigor, you can actually elastically load your fingers. And then you get a very brilliant crisp sound and the fingertips made the sound. You see that, that brilliance? That brilliance is from invoking the fingertip. The fingertip is for incisiveness and clarity and light and brilliance in your sound. But it must be supported by the entire hand arch and especially the hand's hip joint, which is why I leave it for the last, which is why we're not doing it today. But it came up because, you know, this curling without that elastic element will be weak and dysfunctional and anti-structural. But there is a way to curl, but that's for another time. Alan, if I could throw in another observation. Yes, yes Brian. I thought of, of the two institutes that I went to that your description today of the difference between this and this was much more clear. Okay. And I found that as I was playing around with this, it feels like this is one of the missing pieces of, of my, you know, thumb crossover. It seemed a little more fluid when I was, you know, consciously thinking about that today. That's right. That's great. Thank you. That's that's absolutely right. Yes, Kathleen. Uh, I wanted to ask about inhale, exhale. It seems I'm doing it all the time, but as though, though it's a bellows and it's pulling me out and pulling, pushing me in and pulling me out and pushing me. In. Yeah. Well, and is there you a mentioned inhale and exhale because it seems to be yeah i i i feel that this, hmm? Go ahead. That this movement of the hand is in in inhalation it's an in-breath and this movement of the hand this growing the hand arch also pulls me forward it pulls my i call this spinal breathing so for me the spine going into extension is a spinal inhalation and the hand arch breathing out and deflating and the spine going into rounding and flexion it's a spinal out breath so i, I i'm not going to breathe with my lungs at all but the spine is going in out in out the hand in out in out and then hi <laughs> And then if my natural breathing goes along with that, great. But I don't force it. I don't dictate how my lung breathing is going to go. But I do try to sense a, a corollary between the hand breathing and the torso breathing, the, the spinal breathing, the pelvic breathing. It, th that's all of a piece. You can also do it the opposite. You can also push with the hands, slide the hands, and pull with the hands so there but it's still i feel my hands breathing out as i my spine breathes out and the hand breathing in as my spine breathes in so that, is that what you were sort of headed towards uh, it, well I w it really wasn't a question uh, so much as maybe an observation that this spinal breathing powers so much of the playing it does yeah and again, we, we can only touch on it today because that's at the, it's in the last section of Pianos, but yes, absolutely. I guess what I wanted to, to conclude with today would be uh, just a little bit more about the thumb and the integration of the thumb. So if I play a scale, you'll notice that the thumb actually did curl slightly, but that's only because I wanted a little bit of brilliance. So what's gonna does the hand go over in scales or does the hand not go over does the thumb go under in scales or does does the thumb not go under if you try to put your thumb under by curling you are screwed because you're gonna go and you're gonna fall down and the entire hand structure collapses and everything gets dysfunctional now try to put the thumb under by opposing it works instantly 
So I put and do not put my thumb under because I don't put it under by curling it, but I do put it under by opposing it. But when I oppose it, oh, look, I opposed, I opposed, and it didn't even get under. Because as it's opposing to go under, the hand is also moving. And the hand is moving so that as I'm putting my thumb under, the hand is scooting away. So it's this constant, again, it's a breathing. It's an in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out breath. So you, you actually try accenting the thumb by saying, go away, hand. Go away, hand. Go away, hand. The thumb is saying, go away, hand. So those accents will, if you practice that kind of accent slow, stand up on the thumb. Stand up on the thumb. Stand on the thumb. Stand on the thumb. Stand on the stand. Straight standing. Straight standing. Nothing to do with curling. Those accents will translate into an even scale, an even an even scale at fast speeds. Whereas the the accents which we all hear from our students and maybe from ourselves, which come from a dysfunctional anti-structural thumb. I'm trying to put my hand over. I'm going, oh, where are those keys? Where are those keys? My thumb is bent. It's game over. There's going to be unevenness. I'm going to stand my thumb up, stand my thumb up. And now it's there is the key. There's the key. I didn't have to go, where's the key? Because my thumb did the right thing and it got me to my key. So that is why we're spending two whole weeks in July with that thumb much more of what we did today today was just the the you know the tip of the, tip of the iceberg so again it's how you use it will transfer to musical situations now in the lessons that take place in the pianos institute we apply so this is where we we go from a a speculative sensorial experience which is going to give the hand a kind of a grammar of spontaneity. How do I move best to, to achieve my musical ends at the piano? To the practical applications. And uh, we have time for one more question and then we'll take a short break and have our first lesson. Uh, today, Ramon is playing and Christine Olson is playing. And do I have any idea who's going first? Do we know who's going first? Christine, Ramon, Christine's going first. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Ramon, did you want to go first? No. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, uh, before we take a quick break, any more questions or observations or anything about, if you have any questions about what's coming up, like organizational or anything at all uh, mm -hmm. to clear your mind about what's, what's happening in the upcoming Institute? Yes, Diane. Um, how do we sign up? Are you going to email us with the options? Um uh yeah i can actually what i'll do is i'll put it in the chat right now yeah. that's the easiest thing to do uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna put the the link to the summer group and i'm actually gonna put the the link to the actual the the, the register part of the page so uh if you want to read more about about the institute before you actually register then from here You'll just scroll back up to the top and read more about it. But and we uh, buy that, the books on that link as well. Uh, if you want to buy the books here, I can also give you that link. Um, Do it right away because it takes forever to get here. I haven't yeah. got much. Oh, if it's if it's America, it's a disaster. That Louis de Joy has not brought joy to the American post office. So. Uh, here i'll give you the link to the five book set uh, but of course you can buy you know just the teacher's manual and so i'm not going to put all those links up but i'll put this one and uh if you sign up for the institute this summer and the books don't arrive in time the physical copies of the books we will uh, send you a pdf copy so that you'll be able to study the materials before the institute actually starts okay Okay, great. 
Any other practical questions or questions of a esoteric, mystical, technical, musical nature? Yes, Alan, it's me. Oh, I'm, I'm looking around, but I don't see a, a yellow. Who is talking? Yeah, Wave you your hand. Oh, yeah. Alberto. <laughs> Okay. Hi, there. I see you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I I'd like to ask you, um, what if um, I can attend only some lesson, not to the entire course? Uh -huh. Only some some uh, in one in July, two in August. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, is it possible to follow the the lessons or? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, we welcome partial attendance. So we're, the, the eight weeks are designed to be cumulative. So it's best, of course, if you can come to all eight, eight weeks. But if you want to drop in for week three or week four or week five, or, you know, has however many weeks you want, it's quite fine. And each week, each week session stands on its own. So if you miss the first two weeks, you can still come to week three and you won't be totally lost. Now, there we also record the sessions so you can buy the recording. Yes. So if you know you're not going to come, but you want to study that week's topic, then uh, you can you can buy the recording. And that's also at the link that I just sent you. So uh, the link that I just sent you is it's twenty five dollars per session for the you know, so two hundred dollars for the eight sessions, and if you want an individual lesson, that's an extra seventy-five dollars. And then, if you if you don't want to attend but you do want the recording, then it's only twenty dollars instead of twenty-five dollars. Excuse me. What, what about individual lesson? You you said before individual lesson. Yes. So now, for instance, so now the now the group part of the uh, institute is over. Uh, but everybody is welcome to stay because now I give uh, some individual lessons. Oh. And uh, many, many times we have almost everybody staying to watch the individual lesson and then have a little discussion after the lesson. Okay, this is, oh, from chapter eight of Pianimals, you did this in the Clementi Sonata and oh, it made that better. And, and you know, so how does how does chapter 26 work in a Chopin etude? And so we try to apply the pianimals ideas specifically to repertoire situations so that because you're going to be using these materials or you're not because you're an amateur, but teachers will be using these materials with their students. So uh, we try to get an idea. How do we use these ideas to help our students play better by working on our own repertoire? Yeah. By, by the way, in the complete set of five books, there's also, the, besides the teacher's manual, there's also some of the exercises are in a special book called Pianimals Pointers. And that one has uh, photographic illustrations. So you get an even better idea of how the hand should move in that particular exercise. Now the students, they get just the, the two students books of volume one blue and volume two red. They just get the music and the pictures. And the music is in much bigger type. So with the students, it's easier for the students to read. And the pictures are bigger and there's not too many words. So the students don't get confused. So it's up to you, the teacher, to teach the exercises from the teacher's manual. The students, they don't have to read all that stuff. And finally, this is Pianuel's playbook. This is uh, with Primo on the right-hand side and Secundo on the left. So this is for um, uh, 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 duet, uh, recitals and duet playing. It's easier to play from, from this book. So those are my materials. And uh, that's uh, you're welcome to attend any or all of the sessions. And you're welcome to sign up for an individual lesson for as many as you want. We've had some people here who just had one individual lesson or two individual lessons. Ramon, bless his heart, signed up for eight individual lessons. So we've been hearing him play wonderfully every week. 
and uh, that's been a real a real treat so uh that that's how the each weekly session is structured one awareness through piano movement lesson and then three individual lessons tonight we only have two individual lessons Shall we take a short break uh, and then come back? Water in, water out break, and we'll come back to here. Christine Olson, who's playing the Bach Italian Concerto second movement, correct? Yep. Second. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 